I'm very pleased today to have uh, Adam uh, uh, Kilgariff Gil to uh, uh, visit us here and, and give a tech talk. Adam is um, a, a leading expert in uh, uh, word sense. He wrote a PhD thesis many years ago uh, on this topic and has been working with uh, a lot of uh, uh, Companies that combine like world's uh, best uh, dictionaries, like uh, University of, uh, Oxford University Press, and so on. And uh, so uh, I'm very pleased uh, to have Adam here uh, because a lot of uh, a lot of us uh, sort of uh, worry about word sense uh, as well and meaning and so on. Right? Even though kind of mostly we do now is uh, keyword search. All right. Um, without further ado. Thank you very much, and. Um Oops. And, and thank, thanks very much for inviting me. And this is a, a, some English sweets to go round <laughs> to accompany your high quality food from uh, in, the, in your canteen. Uh, is this, how do we switch the. Oh, sorry. The, the Long Road from Text to Meaning, a rather um, grand title. Um, first I'll talk about the research program that is trying to find our way from text towards meaning. Um, and by way of examples, I'll use corpus lexicography, that's making dictionaries from corpora, and word sketching and thesauruses, and if there's time, a quick word on something we're calling collocationality. Um, and a brief word about the data, and then coming back to the title. Do, do pass these on round, please. Um, let's start from something nice and straightforward and obvious. What's language? Well, there's one answer. And there's another answer. And the good thing about it is, that we know what to do with them, that we know since Saussure writing over 100 years ago that we need both of those to have something that's recognisably language. But the issue rolls on, and it rolls on, you know, we know both of those are necessary for language, but it remains as a methodological issue. How are we going to study language? Are we going to study the sorts of stuff that's in our heads, or are we going to study the stuff we find in texts around us? Um, the first approach is you know, explicitly um, supported by you know, approaches, the, the, the competence approach as, as advocated by Chomsky, and that's in the rationalist tradition, and Chomsky makes his debts to Leibniz clear. Um, which is fine. Um, two things to say about it. Firstly, that's, it's, you know, this is a method for finding out about language that involves linguist saying, what do I know? Asking themselves, what do I know? Which is an unusual method for object objective science. Um, but quite apart from the theoretical objections, there's the pra practical problems that the approach to linguistics you get with that approach. People choose one topic that they're interested in and study that, but it's very hard to talk about all the different phenomena that happen in language because linguists don't happen to think of them. So that's the approach based on studying language in our heads. The other approach is to study text. Um, isn't it nice to think of language as something we can study in the same way that physicists study forces and chemists study chemicals? We'll be able to study language because we've got lots and lots of data in speech signals and in, and in text. And that's the empiricist tradition in the line with the British philosophers, John Locke and David Hume. And a, a, kind of a, a, a title I was tempted by for this talk was um, Rationalists and, and Empiricists in the Age of Google, but I decided that would be <laughs> over-egging it. Um, something important to say about this approach is that it's, when we're you know, everyday language users, what's important about a sentence? Well, it's meaning. 
we're mainly interested in what people say and what we're going to say in terms of what in terms of the meaning of what we say. There's something about the corpus methodology, the empiricist methodology, of treating bits of language in the same way that chemists treat chemicals. There isn't any room for the meaning in that approach. We're going to throw away the individual meanings of sentences and just look at patterns. So it's always worth kind of remembering how odd a thing to do with language that is. Um, and of course, with, it's with the advent of computers that this approach has sort of got renewed vigour and renewed strength. Um, you know, we're getting much better at finding patterns in large data sets from machine learning. We've got much larger data sets with corpora and the web. Um, and we've also got, you know, with, 15, with, with, <clears throat> with the advent of computational linguistics or the you know, progress in computational linguistics over the last 20 or 30 years, we've got better and better tools which help us use the large data sets, like lemmatizers and part of speech taggers. It, our, our terms like lemmatizers and part of speech taggers, is, everyone here sort of knows what I mean. And, yes, of course. Uh, well, if you've got an English word like inviting, then one thing you'd quite like to know is that it's a form of the verb invite, and that's what a lemmatizer does. Um, so this sort of way of looking at language has had 15 years of, uh, it's also new. Um, my, my son is now a teenager, my oldest son, um, and at 14 he's, by my estimation, slightly older than the web, which, um, by my reckoning, I, 1994 was the year in which I, it started sort of hitting the newspapers and being talked about. So, um, so it's a teenager. I like the analogy between the web, which is sort of growing at an untrammeled and weird way and nobody knows quite how. The idea that it's now a teenager, this sort of seems to fit. <laughs> Um, so the model for this approach to language research looks a bit like this. Um, that we can, you know, we can input lots and lots of data. We can find patterns in that data. We can then use those patterns to put into a lexicon. I mean, there's quite a lot in computational linguistic work in lexical acquisition from corpora. And that means that we've got, we, we had tools to start with, but we can improve the tools we've got for part of speech tagging and parsing and lemmatizing. And so and then we can always add in more data and get more add in more data and then get more out of the data by um, improving the annotation on it and by extracting more and more patterns from it. And this is, to my mind, a way in which we can sort of make more and more progress at, at understanding the structures in language and the sort of stuff that language is. I'll illustrate it now with a few uh, cases. Firstly, corpus lexicography, making dictionaries from corpora. This splendid fellow is uh, James Murray, who was the editor of the Oxford English Dictionary between 1860 and 1927, when the first edition was published. He died a bit before that, in fact. Um, which goes to show that you really need a very long beard to write a dictionary. Um, the... The stuff behind him, when I talk about corpora, that, that just means a collection of text, for any of you who aren't linguists and aren't used to that. Um, so corpus lexicography is making dictionaries based on lots of evidence found in text. And that's his corpus behind him. It's the pre-computer age, so it's not on a computer. It's on a large set of index cards. Um, there's, a, a, there's a book about a book called the... Um, I think in the States it was called The Professor and the Madman, um, which was about, yes. that, that was about him, yep. Um, <laughs> or he was, he was the professor, he wasn't the madman. Um, <laughs> and the, the process of developing that corpus, people all over the world read books, newspapers, whatever. They came across an interesting, what they considered an interesting use of a word. They wrote the sentence containing the word on an index card, underlining the word that was the one of interest sent it to Oxford, and then it got filed in that filing system un alphabetically under the underlined word. And there are about 20 million of those, and they're all, there's lots of them in the basement at Oxford University Press, where I do quite a lot of work now. And I gave versions of this talk in two places recently where I was able to, one of them was Le Robert in, in Paris, uh, and the other in the Netherlands. Two places where I was able to say, yes, and that's their corpus, like that one's, like that's yours up there on the shelves, as it was in, uh, as it was in Le Robert. So that's corpus lexicography in the pre-computer age. It means when 
James Murray is going to write a dictionary entry, he, he, he usually got one of his children to go running along the corridors to find the right box file with the right with the for the, for the word, um, all organised alphabetically, of course, and then they'd bring that back, and that would be the evidence on which he'd base the definition for that word, which involves lots of running up and down stairs and running around to get the boxes. So around about 1980, um, the observation was made that the computer could do that very well. Of course, in 1980, it's kind of wasn't, you didn't have computers on your desk in 1980. The computer was a large thing involving several rooms downstairs in the basement of the building and sending a request to it involved sending it in paper and getting wadges of paper back. Um, uh, but what the computer could do would produce a keyword in context concordance, something that looked like that. That's a concordance for the English word party or the English lemma party. Um, and so what happened in the co-build project, which was the innovator in this work in the UK, was that the lexicographers were allocated work, were allocated these 30 words to write definitions for, and what they were given along with the allocation of the words was that much paper with all the keyword in context concordance lines on it. And what they then, then did was this, um, to mark it up, to do colour coding for the different meanings. If we look at that concordance, the first one is, uh, which will be used to take a party of underprivileged children. Well, that's party meaning a group of people. We'll call that one the turquoise one. You are invited to a party and after a couple of drinks, well, that's the social event party. We'll call that the green one. We believe politicians of all parties will listen to our views, so that's the red one. So we can go through this concordance <coughs> marking up um, different meanings by giving them different colours. And then when we come round to writing the definition, the dictionary definition for party, we first do the red bits and then we first look at all the red evidence for the red meaning and then all the green evidence for the green meaning and so forth. And that's just the coding. Um, and the, the, the important thing to say about that is use of concordances in that way has revolutionised lexicography. And it's kind of changed how the people writing dictionaries think about what they're doing. Previously, you know, what was it, what was the source of the knowledge that you were going to distill and put on the, put in the dictionary entry? Well, it was in your head. But with corpus evidence, it's become more and more viable to say, well, what I'm going to distill is the concordance lines, is the, is the, is the, is the sort of good evidence I get for, the, for what the word means. Um, so that's been the biggest change in lexicography f uh, from the last century. Um, now I'll just mention a couple of the limitations of it. <coughs> when this corpus get bigger, it's obviously nice to have more data and more evidence. And there's one or two chairs right over here if you want to squeeze through. Uh, it's not very good view viewing lines, but... We're on, we're on making dictionaries with, with corpus evidence. Um, if there's 50 examples for a word, you can just read all of them and base your analysis on that. If there's 500, 500 lines, well, it'll take quite a long time to read all of them, so maybe you don't want to. And if there's 5,000 lines, you're not going to be able to. So then we want to use the, um, we want to use the computer not only for delivering us the data, but also for summarising it in some way. Um, and the basic solution is simply this. You can make a list of the words occurring the in the neighbourhood of the head word with their frequencies. And then you can sort by salience in some way or other to find the words that occur most often or most interestingly and most often in the neighbourhood. This is, um, and that's the sort of list you get. This was actually in the first paper proposing this approach in 1989 um, by Ken Church and Patrick Hanks and looked at, the, looked at all the words to the right of the word save, of the English word save, in a corpus of, I think, 40 million words, um, between one and five words to the right, and added them and saw how often each word occurred there and then applied the uh, mutual information statistic to, and these were, these were the top scoring items. Um, if I sit down, for, I'll, I'll just give you a moment to take a look at that list. And if you're writing a dictionary entry for the word save, what's good about it and what's bad about it? Just take a moment to put yourself in the feet of a lexicographer.
Any um, any suggestions? Things people got a lot of uses. Oh, well, that's a yeah. lot of the words that you see in collocation don't tell you anything about the meaning of same. Like uh, like thousands. Yeah. So thousands isn't isn't very good. One point two dollars. Or your or yeah. annually or yeah. Yeah, the face lights up. Oh, there's a meaning I haven't thought about. It. Yeah, yeah, it's nice that, doesn't it? Yeah. Any other day? So we like we like face. We don't like thousands. We don't like enormous. Is, is this more normalized for like the marginal frequency of each of these words? Yeah. Although thousands cost dollars, enormous uh, dollar sign up there all have monetary aspect yeah. to them, and so. Yeah. So it would be nice to do some sort of clustering yeah, so in that way. Yeah. Money yeah. there. Yeah. You'll miss rare meanings. Miss rare meanings. You'll miss rare meanings if you only show you the top. The most top. Oh yeah. Well, this is for purposes of fitting on the slide. Um, any other uh, any other comments? You sort of have no way to discern it from its opposite. Like waste might have the same. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. That's true. Those often we might be able to come back to that. Yeah. So um, so we uh, we. Found some that we like. I mean, other other ones that we like. We like face, and the other ones, the other ones that we like are um, so. Yeah, we, we might also see that life and lives could be put together, and that would—that's this lemmatization issue. It'd be nice to lemmatize these ones, weren't? Um, and which which other ones do we like other than do, which, other, which other ones look like good evidence? Face. And money, yeah. Life. Lives and yeah. So all, the ones that we like are basically the direct objects. And yours not very good. No, yours definitely not very good. It's kind of quite surprising that yours got in there at all. Um, these ones, what, what's going on with these ones is or enormous and um, and estimated are the, the adjectives governing the direct object. So they're, it's, it's kind of interesting that they occur a lot, but they're they're not directly related to save. They're only related via the um, via the uh, the object. So we might, so we start wanting to think, well, if we, if we added a bit of grammar in here, we could do something more useful. We'd like to get rid of some rubbish, and we'd like to do some lemmatizing, and we'd like to add in some grammar so we can distinct, so we can't, because we know that with verbs, it's pretty obvious, it's, it's pretty often the direct object that's the most interesting thing. Um, thanks very much. Thanks for the, the input. Um, so that's what we've done with it. So, th so the word sketch is like that previous slide, except it's, uh, it brings in the grammar. And bringing in the grammar tends to get rid of a lot of, a lot of the noise as well. Um, and so to make good word sketches, you need a large objects, modifiers, different grammatical relations. And then the statistics haven't changed much from the previous slide, but we can sort them to, uh, uh, but we can have a different list for each grammatical relation, so we can sort of say what different classes they fall in. Um, the, the first version of word sketches went, went into making that piece, the Macmillan English Dictionary for Advanced Learners, um, and was, uh, Michael Rundle, the editor, and I took the, uh, talked about how we'd used word sketches at the, um, at the lexicography conference at, um, in Copenhagen in 2002. And uh, people, people sort of, they, they got a good response, but various people came up afterwards and, and said to me, can I have them for my language, please? And so far, I'd only really thought about doing them for English and hadn't given it any thought. So I said, no, no, it depends on having this large resource for English. And, other sort. and after, after three or four people had asked me that, and I'd given three or four of these very downbeat, negative responses, I thought, well, maybe we can do better. Um, and the upshot of that was a, uh, a product called the Sketch Engine, where the input is any corpus of any language, 
which we like to have lemmatized and part of speech tagged if possible. Um, and then the specification of what all the interesting grammatical relations are for that language, for like objects and subjects and modifiers and heads. Um, and then the system was, is integrated with a corpus query system, which means you can do concordances and sort them and, and uh, find other patterns in a range of ways. Developer was Pavel Rickley from Renault. Um, oh, and uh, we've now got quite a few dictionary publishers using it, Oxford University Press and Collins and Chambers and Macmillan, and quite a few universities. My main reason for being in California is actually because FrameNet, the project at Berkeley, is using it. So I'm talking to them about how, they can, how we can make the best use of it there. Um, and that's the URL. But let's show it now. Um, So that's a word sketch for the English verb engage based on the British National Corpus. So we had 4,000 examples. And by the, by the time we've parsed to identify what the object is and then done some sorting, bearing in mind the marginal frequencies for the word, um, that's what it looks like. Any, any observations about the, the first three words on it in this, in this first column? In relation to the verb engage. Consultant's not one that would have been. Right, there might be, this is British data, so there might be <laughs> British English dif British American differences. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So as we were saying with save face, what you want to what one of the important reasons for using corpora for in dictionary making is to, so that you don't miss any meanings, because it's pretty hard to think of them all off. You know, off, uh, without any external assistance. So it's kind of rather nice, this example, because it immediately says the very first three words it shows you are three completely different meanings of, of engage. Engage attention, that's a sort of mental meaning. Um, engage gears is the straightforward thing you do on cars if they're not automatic. Um, and engage a consultant is employer consultant. I don't know if that usage exists in the States. So three completely different meanings that need separate treatment in the dictionary. We see engage almost exclusively being about, uh, about, about, about get, um, yeah. agreeing to get married. Is this a British versus English, uh, versus American English di distinction, or uh, I've seen each of those used. Hmm? There's I've man, seen each of those man and woman in the second column. Okay, in the second column subject. Ah, let's see. Um, it's always I think that sense in is always passive, which creates a complication. Um, it means these are probably missed paths. Ah, okay. so, so engaged, you so say you're not stemming, and so this would be engaged versus engaged. Well, they should be treated in there. Um, no, even those men engages are not. Uh, the, in, it, there's probably a part of speech tagging issue here that if we, um, no, I'm not, I'm not, it, would, it would take a bit of, I mean, we can do a bit of debugging to, to see why, why nothing about that meaning they were engaged to be married. It's pretty common in Britain. Um, but it's not, it's not a verb. It's not, it's not. Well, it's kind of a, it's, it's, it sort of is a verb. It's just a verb that has to be in the passive in that, in that meaning. So it's surprising that it doesn't feature there. It might be that there aren't any obvious collocations in that meaning. And if we... Um, because if we just uh, got, yeah, <laughs> there's a pretty weak one. Yeah. If we look for um, specifically the, wor the word form engaged, I mean, the nice thing about having the data in a tool is it's you can easily enough. Uh, I should have un. No, I, sorry, I didn't, didn't delete this one. We haven't got we haven't got many engaged to be married there. So, um, we could be a bit more systematic and take a sample, but yes, it seems like maybe it's more maybe it is a British, British American difference. 
Well, it's a pretty wide general purpose corpus, so it would, if that's true, then it would be more about... It's quite surprising it hasn't come up there yet. But, um, this one is, yeah. I can, we could look in other corpora. I've got American ones here, too. Um, we could also... Uh, this, we, we can also do an analysis... Um, look for propose. Well, if we... Um, we yeah, most words do when you start looking at them. So if we look at uh, up to at a window um, between two and five words to the between one and five words to the right of engaged, we can do that too. And so we can sort of we suspect that married might be there. Beyonce. Well, let's we'll, we'll, we'll see what we get. Um, so it'll look, through, it'll look through all those examples and find the colloquies to left. Usually quicker than this, but uh, as I was saying to Deccan earlier, I better not blame the internet connection when I'm at Google. <laughs> <laughs> it's going back across the pond, so there's probably more distance. Yeah. Mm. There's not much discussion of engaged to be married in this course. Four. 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 Oh, yeah, it is, so it is up there with 37 examples, not a, very, not a dramatically high number. Um, the, the word sketches are looking for pre-specified grammatical structures and engaged to be married is sort of, it's kind of, it's a kind of double passive, isn't it? Um, the first clause is passive and the second clause is passive too, so, that, so it, that's not a pattern I would habitually look for. That's really interesting. The seventh one, uh, the sixth one is opposite of married, like engaged in Australia. <laughs> 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 we hope it's the opposite. <laughs> Work. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and this is the tool. Go, do play, it, play with it if you like. We've got um, we've got lots of languages loaded in it now. Um, so we've got we've got sort of most most of the biggest languages in the world: Chinese, English. French, German, Irish, no, not Irish, that's not one of the biggest, Italian, Japanese, and uh, Portuguese and Spanish, and they're mostly web corpora that we've collected, though we've gathered other corpora as and when we can. And for most of those, I've worked with collaborators who are experts in those languages who, who've done things like know what part of speech taggers are best and, and set up the parsing. Back to the, um, the PowerPoint. So regarding those first three uh, words, <coughs> consult any other two corresponding different meanings. Is that also part of the algorithm to like find like the most common thing associated with it, then like find the second most common, given that the first one is not there? We do. I'll I'll, okay. I'll sort of get onto that a bit because right. we do something pretty much like that. Um, but that's uh, yeah, that fits. Good question for leading on to the next part of the next part of the talk. Um, yeah. So is the idea that you sort of put in the syntactic knowledge, so engage is a word, and then you discover the uh, semantic knowledge, or is or do you also discover the syntactic categories of that? Um, it's mainly using using a sh using what we know about syntax to bootstrap. Both finding about, out about semantics, but also finding out more about syntax, because you know one would always hope to be able to improve the grammars that are used to parse the corpus with the output of the uh, of the process. Um, you know, one of the best, one of the sort of leading parsers for English that's around at the moment is um, is one that uses detailed syntactic knowledge from the Longman dictionaries, the uh, the RAS parser, and so if the dictionaries get, you know, if people use this sort of system to make the dictionaries better, that's going to improve the parsers, or the systems might be more tightly integrated than that. Uh, oh, um, so I've shown you word sketches. I was also just going to show you not very... We also thought, well, now we've got these word sketches, we could, um, we could illustrate them, courtesy of Google Images, of course. So this is a just ad, ad bit of decoration. Right, so how did you get these images? You search for the terms in the... 
stick the terms in, in Google Image Search and, and take the first one. Yes. I think we've got an online version of this where they change every so often, but we weren't too <coughs> sure about the copyright status of that, so it's not in public display, I don't know. It's quite nice that uh, culture gets you a sort of splendid image like the path of straight up. Yeah. Um, yeah, so where are we on the overview? Well, I've talked a bit about corpus lexicography and word sketching. Let's get on to thesauruses. Thesauruses a resource that groups words according to similarity. Um, two, two types of thesaurus, manual, like Roger, and there's a picture of Roger, um, and WordNet is pretty much a manual thesaurus. Um, and all the publishers of Thesaurus, you know, Oxford has its Thesaurus, and so does Collins, and so do all, and so does Merriam-Webster and all the other publishers. They're all made by people making judgments about which words belong together. But then there's also automatic Thesauruses. Um, uh, Karen Spark-Jones, who died just last week, was uh, instrumental in you know, proposing the ideas back in the 1960s in her PhD thesis, and then De Kanglin was, uh, was, cent was central to my understanding of what was possible with automatic thesauruses. Um, <coughs> also called distributional thesauruses, and the basic idea is two words are similar if they occur in the same contexts. And something to kind of puzzle about about thesauruses is to what extent are these ones similar to those ones? Because um, thesauruses are extremely useful for language technology or natural language processing. Wherever you've got, you know, for, uh, the reason is really so simple. It's, uh, um, I'll spell it, spell it out anyway. It's because the basic problem with language is you've got sparse data. There are so many words that you don't find most of them in most of the context. So when you come across a new sentence and want to understand it, you're pretty likely not to have found those words in those contexts, those words with those other words before. Um, <coughs> so call that the sparse data problem. Um, and uh, oh, I skipped over one there. Oh no. Um, the the basic question that you often want to ask is, you know, do two words go together or two constructions go together? Does X go with Y? Um, and you don't. Uh, and looking at existing data, you don't know because you've never seen them before. So let's say, well, we can't answer that question. So let's fall back on a, on a variant of that question is, does X and its friends go with Y and its friends? Um, and if they do, then that will provide indirect evidence that X goes with Y. Um, and the thesaurus tells us who the friends are. So, uh, and it's kind of a strategy that looks like, that sometimes goes by the name of backing off or is similar to other strategies that go by the name of backing off. Um, and here's an example. Um, and th that sort of business of trying to find out what goes with what and it being very helpful if you've got a decent backing off strategy is kind of applicable in all sorts of areas of natural language processing um, from speech understanding and spelling correction and, and in various parsing problems. One big parsing problem that I'll illustrate it with is conjunction scope. Um, Do you reckon Are the shoes old? Are the apples old? No, no, the apples aren't old. The shoes might be old. The apples aren't old. So there's a hypothesis there that. So this is a parsing problem because we want to know whether we put brackets around there before we add old, or whether we put brackets around here before we add apples. And, um, and the hypothesis is that uh, <coughs> you'll only get the scope that puts boots and shoes together before you, uh, and has them both modified by old, when the words are similar in meaning to each other. And that's an example of, uh, and this is uh, some work, of, some uh, colleague, Francis Chantry's thesis, does quite a lot of work on this. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> there are lots, lots of scope problems in parsing, that, and um, but th this is one where we think the thesaurus is potentially going to be quite helpful and quite directly helpful, and you know, 
first experiments on it by Francis were promising, if not, they didn't, they didn't immediately solve all the problems. Um, so that's one of, so that's, uh, uh, so that's kind of an example of this very, of the, of an approach which can be applied to lots of problems of using a thesaurus to find out which words um, go with which in order to find which patterns are most widely applicable. Um, of course, there's other sorts of thesaurus, thesaurus you can use, and I was very excited when I discovered Google Sets a couple of years ago because that's also giving us thesaurus information about which things go with which and would also be pretty applicable for these sorts of problems. Um, here's an issue, so thinking again about these two types of thesaurus, automatic ones and manual ones, um, what things do they put, do they say are similar to each other? Well, in the case of automatic thesauruses, it's pretty straightforward. They're talking about words. Manual thesauruses, probably people who start innocently and naively putting words together uh, into, th into different categories of similar meanings think they're putting together words and then they and think they're putting words in a hierarchy and that's appealing idea but then they come across um, crane and they see that crane either belongs with tractors and, uh, <coughs> and other machinery or it belongs with geese and herons and other birds and they think oh no I can't have it can't be words that I'm putting into this hierarchy because some words have different meanings that belong in different places or homonyms. So it can't be words, it must be word senses. Um, there are problems with word senses. There are theoretical problems and practical problems. There's Plato and Aristotle trying to work out what meanings are um, two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, it started a long argument. It's still going on with that bunch of philosophers in the 16th century. Um, and going on all over the world, it's going on in China as well, um, and it still hasn't reached any sort of conclusion. Uh, you know, what, what philosophers have to say about word meanings is bewildering, to put it mildly. It, they, you know, they, we hoped they were these simple objects that we might be able to manipulate and work with, and philosophers have just, just served to show us that they're very complicated, difficult, and not things we should trust at all. Um, most useful thing to my mind, said about word meanings or said about meaning by philosophers was Wittgenstein's comment, don't ask for the meaning, ask for the use. Um, that's the theoretical difficulties. There's a quick summary of the practical difficulties. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> so we want to use a thesaurus because it's a practical tool to help us with other tasks like would uh, like um, like finding the correct path structure or speech recognition, um, and lots of the, <coughs> um, lots of the sources say, well, yes, use me. I'm a helpful resource, but before you can use me, you have to do word sense disambiguation because the things that I organise into structures are word senses, not words. Which would be okay, except there's a huge cost to doing word sense disambiguation before you can use those tools. Um, <clears throat> and, um, well, there's, I've been involved in lots of work on evaluating words since disambiguations, but I won't get distracted now, but uh, I think it would be a fair comment to say that under optimal conditions, the best sort of approach is you might get something approaching 80%, um, which isn't very good. It means something like if you want to use this tool, you know, to use this tool, first replace one-fifth of your input with junk, which isn't kind of very promising. Well, yeah, kind of. It's not obvious what 100% means because word sense is, owing to all those philosophical difficulties, are such awkward things that, um, that dictionaries typically give different sets of meanings for words and all those. So um, people don't get 100% if you view 100% as, if you measure it as intertagal agreement. If you get but, but, but most of the errors would be obvious to a human. Yeah, mostly they're not, er they're not errors that anyone wants to argue about very much. There. There because there's an area of grey between the one meaning and the next. Um, but but what, that, what that little diatribe or aside is meant to, the conclusion from it is that we should really avoid word senses. 
um, because getting distracted into them means that we, we're introducing a whole set of other problems that are harder than the problem we wanted to solve in the first place. So we don't really want to say this word has three meanings or three senses, but in Wittgensteinian mode we want to say this word has three kinds of use. Because if we've done that, then we've got something fairly well-founded and empirical that we can build on. Um, how does that fit into the overall... So I'm a, a fan of uh, automatic thesauruses, which manipulate words much more than manual ones, which manipulate meanings of words. Uh, can you say something on why you even want to say that it has three uses? I mean, that might be fuzzy as well. Can't you just get along with saying, oh, this use is similar to this one, but I don't really know whether it's three or four and a half uses? Uh, quite likely, depending on the particular task. So, um, I mean, the, 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 typical, the sort of typical reason why people have wanted to, um, people have wanted to use thesauruses in artificial intelligence a lot with, artificial re with, with automatic reasoning. Um, and uh, so to put, to put meanings into hierarchies and then to be able to use is a relations and that sort of approach in order to draw inferences. And... Um, so I kind of think that from artificial intelligence, it's pretty desirable that, um, that from an artificial intelligence point of view, then saying that don't talk about the meaning, talk about the use isn't very helpful because they want things that they can, uh, that are in hierarchies that they can draw inferences over. So there's a set of pressures to, 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 uh, to be talking about word meanings rather than, rather than word uses, which, is, which I haven't really said much about here. That's the kind of counter-argument. That, well, that's the, that's the th thesis which I'm offering a position against, in a way. And to come back to this overall picture, um, I hope the you know, things like the old boots and shoes example have given, you, have given an indication of how thesaurus is a particularly useful tool in this sort of looping around, because we can use it to find more patterns, and it, it's kind of lexical information that we can add into improve our parsing and also other processes to get more structure out um, uh, so that we can sort of loop around and in a because the other bigger part of the question is well we want to divide thing we want to sort of make progress in in getting towards a richer and richer understanding of language and we're going to have to do things about meaning in some way or other or we will we'll, we'll kind of miss the point I'll come back to that right at the end actually because that's um it's, it's there Oh, um, this is just another example of this sort of looping process, the sort of thing we can find out when we've got a big corpus and uh, in the right sort of database. Um, which words are most collocational? It's a question, um, which words have a strongest tendency to occur, occur in collocations? Which is maybe, for this audience, it won't be obvious why that might be an interesting question. But it's sort of a characteristic of some, some words... <coughs> do have very strong tendencies to occur with fixed patterns of words, and others are much more, um, much more willing to go with whatever other words there are, much more promiscuous. They just go with whatever other words there are around. Um, it's imp do you wreak anything but havoc? Exactly, yeah. Um, well, we've got examples a bit like that. Um, so this came up because for dictionary publishers, they'd like to warn their readers, or they'd like to tell their readers which words are particularly inclined, you know, which words... You know, beware of the word reek because you shouldn't use it with anything much except havoc, they want to be able to say. Um, and that's useful information for language learners. Um, so I was asked by Macmillan, how can you, how, can you help us work out where we should give information to, to our dictionary readers about words that have particularly coll strong collocational patterns? Um, I thought about it a bit and realised that this collocation was an awful lot like entropy. Um, and we could take every verb and look at the objects it had. Um, we knew its frequency from the database, you know, from the corpus. We knew its... Um, uh, oh, th th that's just a probabilistic version of that column, I think. And then this one's... Um, and we could calculate its entropy in that column there, which was all very simple sums. And it meant we could work out which verbs had, had highest entropy for their, um, for their direct object slot. 
and produce a graph like that, which maps frequency against entropy. And so we know, so it's actually the, so it's the, the ones, for, and the, there's a bit of normalizing to do with the um, overall frequency because there's a tendency for it to go up. And then we can say that the ones, the ones with the lowest score here are the ones which, where it's most worth considering telling the language users something about the, um, something about the fact that they've got strong tendency to go just with a smallish number of words. Uh, here are the words from the British National Corpus which had I never remember if it's highest or lowest entropy. Highest collocationality. I'll avoid the issue like that. Most of them you can sort of quickly see what, what it is they tend to go with. Door was quite a nice one because um, there aren't actually that many things you do with doors. You open them and you close them and you shut them and you lock them. But, but they weren't, you know. But there aren't many other verbs that door is object of. Um, place is most dominated by take place. Most of them are dominated by one or maybe two collocates. Any questions about anything? anything you... Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pay tribute to. They, they're kind of mostly fairly obvious. Um, play tennis. Um, oh, we have got, yes, we have got your example there. What does spokesman call it? Say, said, a missed pause. Of, is there, it's, uh, there's always parsing problems. So one thing that you get in, uh, the, one thing that you get forever in journalistic texts is said the spokesman. And because it often occurs the wrong way around, the wrong way around, you know, um, it was impossible, said the spokesman. And because we've got this, English usually has the subject in front of the verb, but where you've got quoted speech, it will often have it the wrong way around. So that's why it's firstly misparsed it, and then that's dominated by said or stated. Are these all supposed to be nouns? Yeah. Or are they yeah. uh, built at all? So all of these seem to have the same partner, like take, and yeah, take, take place or something. I mean, is there is that weird? Should it really be something else? Or? Yeah, could you normalize these for like the frequency <laughs> of that word that they... Yeah, that's that would be a further sophistication that I've thought yeah. about but haven't haven't done yet. Of. Like wreak havoc, you know, you know, havoc's rare, so it's wreak. Yeah, yeah. So this, yeah, this doesn't bear those frequencies in mind, and I, I agree, it would be interesting to see what, would, how that would change things. Uh, um, right, the next bit I was going to say a tiny bit about in the talk was about the data. Um, so all I've been proposing is, you know, having lots of data is important. Um, that's a simple summary of how data sizes have changed over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, a nice straight line, providing you put a logarithmic scale up this side. Though maybe now we're going up steeper than that with the width. Um, and that's great because the bigger the data set, the better the results you get, the more you can do. <coughs> um, for you... And one of the one of my main sort of research agendas is getting people to realise the potential and benefits of using the web for corpora. The, until not so long ago, um, you know, people would. It, it's quite you know, the web is so new that you know, the British National Corpus doesn't have words like login because they didn't exist when it was built. Um, and it's always worth remembering that. And people carry on using the British National Corpus, which was very long and painful process of building. It involved lots of writing to publishers to get electronic texts, but that was done in the late 1980s and early 1990s, and the world is transformed as far as those things are concerned. Um, oh, <coughs> I, I put these slides in mainly because I wrote a paper just recently called Googleology is Bad Science, so I thought I'd better explain what I meant by that in case people had read it and wanted to object. Um, if we want to use the web as a corpus, then um, there's sort of two ways of doing it, either via Google or as I was, uh, uh, somebody I was at a meeting with the other day said, Google, didn't, didn't say Google, he said um, search engines with two O's in them. <laughs> 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 so we can use search engines with two O's in them or not. Um, <coughs> And it's very tempting to use the ones with two O's in because there are no setup costs. You can start querying today and you can immediately get some sort of evidence to test a theory. Um, the methods of using them could be 
just using the hit counts or using um, using the snippets that are in the in the search results page, or you can find the page, or, uh, which is like what some meta search engines do. There's one called Web Corp, which has been around a while, or you can find the pages and download them. Um, there's been quite a lot of NLP research which uses Google or Yahoo, and then um, <coughs> and uh, for example, the, uh, um, and and to, to, to gather lots of evidence. For example, these are two pieces of work that use the hit counts. There's one by Keller and Lapata, which um, which made 36 queries to estimate the frequency of fulfill obligation, um, and because they wanted to check various different forms of the noun verb pair and various different, whether it, you know, what the form, what the exact form was, and they had to try them all separately. Um, and Oh, and here's another quotation from some similar work. The, there's, been a, there's a small community of researchers doing this sort of work. There's a wonderful thing called the Corpora mailing list, which is the main discussion forum. Um, the group has intense interest in query syntax um, and care greatly if there's one very marginal and minor change to the Google query syntax or the Yahoo's query syntax. So that was at, that, at the time they did the queries, that was a legitimate query with some, um, with some wild carding. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not a very good way to do science because um, you'll only give us a thousand hits for query. Um, you'll only allow us a thousand queries for a day through the API, and I think that's, that service is being terminated or is at least shows signs of not being trustworthy for the medium or the long term future. Um, and uh, the 10 word snippet around each search term, that's not enough. And you've got this ridiculous sort order. We want, we want a random sample of all the instances of the word. <laughs> <laughs> you won't give it to us. <laughs> <He's asked>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, untrustworthy hit counts. Um, I'm, there's lots of. I, I'm, uh, they're not trustworthy. I'm sure you know much more about that than me. Um, uh, limited search syntax, uh, no regular expressions, and of course it's, they're linguistically done. You don't do lemmatizing and, uh, and part of speech tagging and parsing. So they're all reasons for not doing linguistic, not doing linguistic research using Google as an interface to the web. Um, External interface to Google. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, really, my um, my uh, my agenda, this, the agenda of the of the paper I wrote is is exactly not you. It's to actually to say we want everyone else to have as good access to the web as you have. Which that's that's exactly the agenda. One technique that I suggest by linguistic friends when they play mm. some of these things, which the problem is, of course, they care deeply, and most of our users are like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. is. Add helicopter Cincinnati to the query. Yeah, which you do some of that. Yeah. Then yeah. you get sampling. You do. You get. You do, but it's, it's, but you, it's uh, tricky. It's but running. It's it's the wrong way around. It's yeah. You can, and some of those methods have, and I've done that sort of thing myself. Um, but you don't really know whether helicopter and Cincinnati are arbitrary, uh, randomly sampled, and there's definitely not. And, and so, how many noise words, and how do you choose the noise words, and what? How do you compensate? Yeah. So. Um, so um, so, so this is kind of the, the moral of this story, that using Google looks very appealing because it's zero cost entry. Um, you just start Googling. But the reality is that if you want to do dependable, solid scientific research on it, it's, it isn't really much of a shortcut because you hit, about, you hit all the other issues. So um, uh, things aren't replicable. And of course, commercial companies don't tell you the innards of how you're, choos how you're choosing which things to put where. Um, so that's the justification for my comment there. Um, the, so what I'm really involved in is the, the not answer here, which is, um, and I've been involved in things like we've set up a special interest, in, uh, Association of Computational Linguistics is ACL, special interest group on the web as corpus, which wants to use open source methods and um, some of you might be interested in our next workshop coming up in September. Um, as I said, the corpora in the sketch engine, are quite a lot of them are large web corpora.
Oh, at this point, I have to say to Google, thank you very much on behalf of the academic community for Web 1T, the, uh, you know, the, the, the trillion words, the, all, all the engrams coming out of a trillion words of data. It's kind of wonderful. <laughs> Um, so, to, uh, so how does all this fit together? Um, well, back to rationalists and empiricists. We've got um, one way of thinking about language is, well, there's two kinds of people who want to study language. And one set of the rationalists, and they're most interested in the meanings, and they want to work out things in the formal semantics tradition of how meanings of words go together to make meanings of sentences and how an answer to a question happens to be, you know, how you can present a, um, mostly how meanings of words want to go to meanings of sentences and how meanings of sentences will combine to give new meanings. And that's, uh, you know, that's the logic tradition, if you like, with, yeah, yeah. And um, at the other end, we've got empiricists who are, who are mainly interested in the raw data. And... Um, what tends to happen is that the empiricists starting down here and the rationalists going down there, and both of them think they're talking about the same thing as each other, but in fact there's this great big gap in between. Um, and w the sort of method with the spiral that I'm, I've been advocating here is, can sort of be represented a bit like that, that. Well, when it was raw text, we were just dealing with characters, with you know, a string of characters. We weren't dealing with anything that we could talk about linguistically. Then once we've tokenized and lemmatized it, well, then we can start talking about words, which is better than talking about strings. So down here, we're talking about strings. Here, we're talking about words. Well, by the time we've part of speech tagged it, we're talking about, well, we've got a richer idea of what the word is. And then we can start talking about grammatical structure as well, we, once we've parsed it. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm visiting FrameNet. And my, each of these stages makes it a bit more linguistic, a bit more like we're talking about meaning, which is in a way a response to your question earlier. We, we, want to, we really want to meet up with those guys. We'd like to be able to talk about the, um, the different relation, you know, the, the logical relations between related sentences. But it's an awful long way. Um, and my kind of, I, I'm keen to work with FrameNet because the, uh, the approach there with frames as structures for conveying the meaning, for holding the meanings of words is kind of the next step up on this on this uh, agenda. So this is, the, this is the long road from text to meaning. I think we're still an awful long way away. There are many other things to do between times, but join me on the journey. Thank you very much.